Demetrios Contus By Jack London It must not be thought, from what I have told of the Greek fishermen, that they were altogether bad. Far from it. But they were rough men, gathered together in isolated communities and fighting with the elements for a livelihood. They lived far away from the law and its workings, did not understand it, and thought it tyranny. Especially did the fish laws seem tyrannical. And because of this, they looked upon the men of the fish patrol as their natural enemies. We menaced their lives, or their living, which is the same thing, in many ways. We confiscated illegal traps and nets, the materials of which had cost them considerable sums and the making of which required weeks of labor. We prevented them from catching fish at many times and seasons, which was equivalent to preventing them from making as good a living as they might have made had we not been in existence. And when we captured them, they were brought into the courts of law, where heavy cash fines were collected from them. As a result, they hated us vindictively. As the dog is the natural enemy of the cat, the snake of man, so were we of the fish patrol the natural enemies of the fishermen. But it is to show that they could act generously as well as hate bitterly that this story of Demetrios Contus is told. Demetrios Contus lived in Vallejo. Next to Big Alec, he was the largest, bravest, and most influential man among the Greeks. He had given us no trouble, and I doubt if he would ever have clashed with us had he not invested in a new salmon boat. This boat was the cause of all the trouble. He had had it built upon his own model, in which the lines of the general salmon boat were somewhat modified. To his high elation he found his new boat very fast, in fact, faster than any other boat on the bay or rivers. Forthwith he grew proud and boastful, and, arrayed with the Mary Rebecca on the Sunday salmon fishers having wrought fear in their hearts, he sent a challenge up to Benicia. One of the local fishermen conveyed it to us, it was to the effect that Demetrios Contas would sail up from Vallejo on the following Sunday, and in the plain sight of Benicia set his net and catch salmon, and that Charlie Legrant, patrolman, might come and get him if he could. Of course Charlie and I had heard nothing of the new boat. Our own boat was pretty fast, and we were not afraid to have a brush with any other that happened along. Sunday came. The challenge had been bruited abroad, and the fishermen and seafaring folk of Benicia turned out to a man, crowding steamboat wharf till it looked like the grand stand at a football match. Charlie and I had been skeptical, but the fact of the crowd convinced us that there was something in Demetrios Contoza's dare. In the afternoon, when the sea breeze had picked up in strength, his sail hove into view as he bowled along before the wind. He tacked a score of feet from the wharf, waved his hand theatrically, like a knight about to enter the lists, received a hearty cheer in return, and stood away into the straits for a couple of hundred yards. Then he lowered sail, and, drifting the boat sidewise by means of the wind, proceeded to set his net. He did not set much of it, possibly fifty feet, yet Charlie and I were thunderstruck at the man's effrontery. We did not know at the time, but we learned afterward, that the net he used was old and worthless. It could catch fish, true, but a catch of any size would have torn it to pieces. Charlie shook his head and said, I confess, it puzzles me. What if he is out only fifty feet? He could never get it in if we once started for him. And why does he come here anyway, flaunting his law-breaking in our faces? Right in our hometown, too. Charlie's voice took on an aggrieved tone, and he continued for some minutes to inveigh against the brazenness of Demetrios Contus. In the meantime, the man in question was lolling in the stern of his boat and watching the net floats. When a large fish is meshed in a gill net, the floats by their agitation advertise the fact. And they evidently advertised it to Demetrios, for he pulled in about a dozen feet of net, and held aloft for a moment, before he flung it into the bottom of the boat, a big, glistening salmon. It was greeted by the audience on the wharf with round after round of cheers. This was more than Charlie could stand. Come on, lad, he called to me, and we lost no time jumping into our salmon boat and getting up sail. The crowd shouted warning to Demetrios, and as we darted out from the wharf we saw him slash his worthless net clear with a long knife. His sail was all ready to go up, 
and a moment later it fluttered in the sunshine. He ran aft, drew in the sheet, and filled on the long tack toward the Contra Costa Hills. By this time we were not more than thirty feet astern. Charlie was jubilant. He knew our boat was fast, and he knew, further, that in fine sailing few men were his equals. He was confident that we should surely catch Demetrios, and I shared his confidence. But somehow we did not seem to gain. It was a pretty sailing breeze. We were gliding sleekly through the water, but Demetrios was slowly sliding away from us. And not only was he going faster, but he was eating into the wind a fraction of a point closer than we. This was sharply impressed upon us when he went about under the Contra Costa hills and passed us on the other tack fully one hundred feet dead to windward. Phew! Charlie exclaimed. Either that boat is a daisy, or we've got a five-gallon coal oil can fast to our keel. It certainly looked it one way or the other. And by the time Demetrios made the Sonoma Hills, on the other side of the straits, we were so hopelessly outdistanced that Charlie told me to slack off the sheet, and we squared away for Benicia. The fishermen on Steamboat Wharf showered us with ridicule when we returned and tied up. Charlie and I got out and walked away, feeling rather sheepish, for it is a sore stroke to one's pride when he thinks he has a good boat and knows how to sail it, and another man comes along and beats him. Charlie mooned over it for a couple of days, then word was brought to us, as before, that on the next Sunday Demetrios Contas would repeat his performance. Charlie roused himself. He had our boat out of the water, cleaned and repainted its bottom, made a trifling alteration about the centerboard, overhauled the running gear, and sat up nearly all of Saturday night sewing on a new and much larger sail. So large did he make it, in fact, that additional ballast was imperative, and we stowed away nearly 500 extra pounds of old railroad iron in the bottom of the boat. Sunday came, and with it came Demetrios Contas, to break the law defiantly in open day. Again we had the afternoon sea breeze, and again Demetrios cut loose some forty or more feet of his rotten net, and got up sail and underway under our very noses. But he had anticipated Charlie's move, and his own sail peaked higher than ever, while a whole extra cloth had been added to the after leech. It was nip and tuck across to the Contra Costa Hills, neither of us seeming to gain or to lose. But by the time we had made the return tack to the Sonoma Hills, we could see that, while we footed it at about equal speed, Demetrios had eaten into the wind the least bit more than we. Yet Charlie was sailing our boat as finely and delicately as it was possible to sail it, and getting more out of it than he ever had before. Of course, he could have drawn his revolver and fired at Demetrios, but we had long since found it contrary to our natures to shoot at a fleeing man guilty of only a petty offence. Also a sort of tacit agreement seemed to have been reached between the patrolmen and the fishermen. If we did not shoot while they ran away, they, in turn, did not fight if we once laid hands on them. Thus Demetrios Contas ran away from us, and we did no more than try our best to overtake him, and, in turn, if our boat proved faster than his, or was sailed better, he would, we knew, make no resistance when we caught up with him. With our large sails and the healthy breeze romping up the Carquinas Straits, we found that our sailing was what is called ticklish. We had to be constantly on the alert to avoid a capsize, and while Charlie steered I held the main sheet in my hand with but a single turn round a pin, ready to let go at any moment. Demetrios, we could see, sailing his boat alone, had his hands full. But it was a vain undertaking for us to attempt to catch him. Out of his inner consciousness he had evolved a boat that was better than ours. And though Charlie sailed fully as well, if not the least bit better, the boat he sailed was not so good as the Greeks. Slack away the sheet, Charlie commanded, and as our boat fell off before the wind, Demetrios's mocking laugh floated down to us. Charlie shook his head, saying, it's no use. Demetrios has the better boat. If he tries his performance again, we must meet it with some new scheme. This time it was my imagination that came to the rescue. What's the matter, I suggested, on the Wednesday following, with my chasing Demetrios in the boat next Sunday, while you wait for him on the wharf at Vallejo when he arrives? 
Charlie considered it a moment and slapped his knee. A good idea. You're beginning to use that head of yours. A credit to your teacher, I must say. But you mustn't chase him too far, he went on, the next moment, or he'll head out into San Pablo Bay instead of running home to Vallejo, and there I'll be, standing lonely on the wharf and waiting in vain for him to arrive. On Thursday Charlie registered an objection to my plan. Everybody'll know I've gone to Vallejo, and you can depend upon it that Demetrios will know, too. I'm afraid we'll have to give up the idea. This objection was only too valid, and for the rest of the day I struggled under my disappointment. But that night a new way seemed to open to me, and in my eagerness I awoke Charlie from a sound sleep. Well, he grunted, what's the matter? How's a fire? No, I replied, but my head is. Listen to this. On Sunday you and I will be around Benicia up to the very moment Demetrios's sail heaves into sight. This will lull everybody's suspicions. Then, when Demetrios's sail does heave in sight, do you stroll leisurely away and uptown. All the fishermen will think you're beaten and that you know you're beaten. So far, so good, Charlie commented, while I paused to catch breath. And very good indeed, I continued proudly. You stroll carelessly uptown, but when you're once out of sight you leg it for all you're worth for Dan Maloney's. Take the little mare of his, and strike out on the country road for Vallejo. The road's in fine condition, and you can make it in quicker time than Demetrios can beat all the way down against the wind. And I'll arrange right away for the mare, first thing in the morning, Charlie said, accepting the modified plan without hesitation. But, I say, he said, a little later, this time waking me out of a sound sleep. I could hear him chuckling in the dark. I say, lad, isn't it rather a novelty for the fish patrol to be taking to horseback? Imagination, I answered. It's what you're always preaching, keep thinking one thought ahead of the other fellow, and you're bound to win out. He, he, he chuckled. And if one thought ahead, including a mare, doesn't take the other fellow's breath away this time, I'm not your humble servant. Charlie Legrand. But can you manage the boat alone, he asked, on Friday. Remember, we've a ripping big sail on her. I argued my proficiency so well that he did not refer to the matter again till Saturday, when he suggested removing one whole cloth from the after leech. I guess it was the disappointment written on my face that made him desist, for I, also, had a pride in my boat sailing abilities, and I was almost wild to get out alone with the big sail and go tearing down the Coquinus Straits in the wake of the Flying Greek. As usual, Sunday and Demetrios Contus arrived together. It had become the regular thing for the fishermen to assemble on Steamboat Wharf to greet his arrival and to laugh at our discomfiture. He lowered sail a couple of hundred yards out and set his customary fifty feet of rotten net. I suppose this nonsense will keep up as long as his old net holds out. Charlie grumbled, with intention, in the hearing of several of the Greeks. Then I give a he my old a net a, one of them spoke up, promptly and maliciously. I don't care, Charlie answered. I've got some old net myself he can have if he'll come around and ask for it. They all laughed at this, for they could afford to be sweet-tempered with a man so badly outwitted as Charlie was. Well, so long. Lad, Charlie called to me a moment later. I think I'll go uptown to Maloney's. Let me take the boat out. I asked. If you want to, was his answer, as he turned on his heel and walked slowly away. Demetrios pulled two large salmon out of his net, and I jumped into the boat. The fishermen crowded around in a spirit of fun, and when I started to get up sail overwhelmed me with all sorts of jocular advice. They even offered extravagant bets to one another that I would surely catch Demetrios, and two of them, styling themselves the committee of judges, gravely asked permission to come along with me to see how I did it. But I was in no hurry. I waited to give Charlie all the time I could, 
and I pretended dissatisfaction with the stretch of the sail and slightly shifted the small tackle by which the huge sprit forces up the peak. It was not until I was sure that Charlie had reached Dan Maloney's and was on the little mare's back, that I cast off from the wharf and gave the big sail to the wind. A stout puff filled it and suddenly pressed the lee gunnel down till a couple of buckets of water came in board. A little thing like this will happen to the best small boat sailors, and yet, though I instantly let go the sheet and righted, I was cheered sarcastically, as though I had been guilty of a very awkward blunder. When Demetrio saw only one person in the fish patrol boat, and that one a boy, he proceeded to play with me. Making a short tack out, with me not thirty feet behind, he returned, with his sheet a little free, to Steamboat Wharf. And there he made short tacks, and turned and twisted and ducked around, to the great delight of his sympathetic audience. I was right behind him all the time, and I dared to do whatever he did, even when he squared away before the wind and jibed his big sail over a most dangerous trick with such a sail in such a wind. He depended upon the brisk sea breeze and the strong ebb tide, which together kicked up a nasty sea, to bring me to grief. But I was on my mettle, and never in all my life did I sail a boat better than on that day. I was keyed up to concert pitch, my brain was working smoothly and quickly, my hands never fumbled once, and it seemed that I almost divined the thousand little things which a small boat sailor must be taking into consideration every second. It was Demetrios who came to grief instead. Something went wrong with his centerboard, so that it jammed in the case and would not go all the way down. In a moment's breathing space, which he had gained from me by a clever trick, I saw him working impatiently with the centerboard, trying to force it down. I gave him little time, and he was compelled quickly to return to the tiller and sheet. The centerboard made him anxious. He gave over playing with me, and started on the long beat to Vallejo. To my joy, on the first long tack across, I found that I could eat into the wind just a little bit closer than he. Here was where another man in the boat would have been of value to him, for, with me but a few feet astern, he did not dare let go the tiller and run amidships to try to force down the centerboard. Unable to hang on as close in the eye of the wind as formerly, he proceeded to slack his sheet a trifle and to ease off a bit, in order to outfoot me. This I permitted him to do till I had worked to windward, when I bore down upon him. As I drew close, he fainted at coming about. This led me to shoot into the wind to forestall him. But it was only a feint, cleverly executed, and he held back to his course while I hurried to make up lost ground. He was undeniably smarter than I when it came to manoeuvring. Time after time I all but had him, and each time he tricked me and escaped. Besides, the wind was freshening, constantly, and each of us had his hands full to avoid capsizing. As for my boat, it could not have been kept afloat but for the extra ballast. I sat cocked over the weather gunnel, tiller in one hand and sheet in the other, and the sheet, with a single turn around a pin, I was very often forced to let go in the severer puffs. This allowed the sail to spill the wind, which was equivalent to taking off so much driving power, and of course I lost ground. My consolation was that Demetrios was as often compelled to do the same thing. The strong ebb tide, racing down the straits in the teeth of the wind, caused an unusually heavy and spiteful sea, which dashed aboard continually. I was dripping wet, and even the sail was wet halfway up the after leech. Once I did succeed in outmaneuvering Demetrios, so that my bow bumped into him amidships. Here was where I should have had another man. Before I could run forward and leap aboard, he shoved the boats apart with an oar, laughing mockingly in my face as he did so. We were now at the mouth of the straits, in a bad stretch of water. Here the Vallejo Straits and the Carquina Straits rushed directly at each other. Through the first flowed all the water of Napa River and the Great Tidelands, through the second flowed all the water of Suesun Bay and the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers. And where such immense bodies of water, flowing swiftly, clashed together, a terrible tide rip was produced. To make it worse, the wind held up San Pablo Bay for 15 miles and drove in a tremendous sea upon the tide rip. Conflicting currents tore about in all directions, colliding, forming whirlpools, sucks, and boils, 
and shooting up spitefully into hollow waves which fell aboard as often from leeward as from windward. And through it all, confused, driven into a madness of motion, thundered the great smoking seas from San Pablo Bay. I was as wildly excited as the water. The boat was behaving splendidly, leaping and lurching through the welter like a racehorse. I could hardly contain myself with the joy of it. The huge sail, the howling wind, the driving seas, the plunging boat, I, a pygmy, a mere speck in the midst of it, was mastering the elemental strife, flying through it and over it, triumphant and victorious. And just then, as I roared along like a conquering hero, the boat received a frightful smash and came instantly to a dead stop. I was flung forward and into the bottom. As I sprang up I caught a fleeting glimpse of a greenish, barnacle-covered object, and knew it at once for what it was, that terror of navigation, a sunken pile. No man may guard against such a thing. Waterlogged and floating just beneath the surface, it was impossible to sight it in the troubled water in time to escape. The whole bow of the boat must have been crushed in, for in a few seconds the boat was half full. Then a couple of seas filled it, and it sank straight down, dragged to bottom by the heavy ballast. So quickly did it all happen that I was entangled in the sail and drawn under. When I fought my way to the surface, suffocating, my lungs almost bursting, I could see nothing of the oars. They must have been swept away by the chaotic currents. I saw Demetrios Contus looking back from his boat, and heard the vindictive and mocking tones of his voice as he shouted exultantly. He held steadily on his course, leaving me to perish. There was nothing to do but to swim for it, which, in that wild confusion, was at the best a matter of but a few moments. Holding my breath and working with my hands, I managed to get off my heavy sea boots and my jacket. Yet there was very little breath I could catch to hold, and I swiftly discovered that it was not so much a matter of swimming as of breathing. I was beaten and buffeted, smashed under by the great San Pablo whitecaps, and strangled by the hollow tide rip waves which flung themselves into my eyes, nose, and mouth. Then the strange sucks would grip my legs and drag me under, to spout me up in some fierce boiling, where, even as I tried to catch my breath, a great white cap would crash down upon my head. It was impossible to survive any length of time. I was breathing more water than air, and drowning all the time. My senses began to leave me, my head to whirl around. I struggled on, spasmodically, instinctively, and was barely half conscious when I felt myself caught by the shoulders and hauled over the gunwale of a boat. For some time I lay across a seat where I had been flung, face downward, and with the water running out of my mouth. After a while, still weak and faint, I turned around to see who was my rescuer. And there, in the stern, sheet in one hand and tiller in the other, grinning and nodding good-naturedly, sat Demetrios Contus. He had intended to leave me to drown, he said so afterward, but his better self had fought the battle, conquered, and sent him back to me. You all a right? he asked. I managed to shape a yes on my lips, though I could not yet speak. You say lay de boat very good day, he said. So good day as a man. A compliment from Demetrios Contus was a compliment indeed, and I keenly appreciated it, though I could only nod my head in acknowledgement. We held no more conversation, for I was busy recovering and he was busy with the boat. He ran into the wharf at Vallejo, made the boat fast, and helped me out. Then it was, as we both stood on the wharf, that Charlie stepped out from behind a net rack and put his hand on Demetrios Contos's arm. He saved my life, Charlie, I protested, and I don't think he ought to be arrested. A puzzled expression came into Charlie's face, which cleared immediately after, in a way it had when he made up his mind. I can't help it, lad, he said kindly. I can't go back on my duty, and it's plain duty to arrest him. Today is Sunday, there are two salmon in his boat which he caught today. What else can I do? But he saved my life, I persisted, unable to make any other argument. Demetrios Contoza's face went black with rage when he learned Charlie's judgment. 
he had a sense of being unfairly treated. The better part of his nature had triumphed, he had performed a generous act and saved a helpless enemy, and in return the enemy was taking him to jail. Charlie and I were out of sorts with each other when we went back to Benicia. I stood for the spirit of the law and not the letter, but by the letter Charlie made his stand. As far as he could see, there was nothing else for him to do. The law said distinctly that no salmon should be caught on Sunday. He was a patrolman, and it was his duty to enforce that law. That was all there was to it. He had done his duty, and his conscience was clear. Nevertheless, the whole thing seemed unjust to me, and I felt very sorry for Demetrios Contus. Two days later we went down to Vallejo to the trial. I had to go along as a witness, and it was the most hateful task that I ever performed in my life when I testified on the witness stand to seeing Demetrios catch the two salmon Charlie had captured him with. Demetrios had engaged a lawyer, but his case was hopeless. The jury was out only fifteen minutes, and returned a verdict of guilty. The judge sentenced Demetrios to pay a fine of one hundred dollars or go to jail for fifty days. Charlie stepped up to the clerk of the court. I want to pay that fine, he said, at the same time placing five twenty-dollar gold pieces on the desk. It, it was the only way out of it, lad, he stammered, turning to me. The moisture rushed into my eyes as I seized his hand. I want to pay, I began. To pay your half, he interrupted. I certainly shall expect you to pay it. In the meantime Demetrios had been informed by his lawyer that his fee likewise had been paid by Charlie. Demetrios came over to shake Charlie's hand, and all his warm southern blood flamed in his face. Then, not to be outdone in generosity, he insisted on paying his fine and lawyer's fee himself, and flew halfway into a passion because Charlie refused to let him. More than anything else we ever did, I think, this action of Charlie's impressed upon the fishermen the deeper significance of the law. Also Charlie was raised high in their esteem, while I came in for a little share of praise as a boy who knew how to sail a boat. Demetrios Contus not only never broke the law again, but he became a very good friend of ours, and on more than one occasion he ran up to Benicia to have a gossip with us.